So like a lot of other people, when I, when I did the slides and then I started to time myself, I think I was a little ambitious in terms of what I was going to get through. So I've got a lot of information. I'll try to get through as much as possible. I want to talk about the Fourth and Fifth Amendments uh, simply because those concern the majority of uh, interactions most individuals have with police officers. So that's the text of the Fourth Amendment. Um, essentially what it says is the Fourth Amendment um, protects individuals from unreasonable searches and seizures of their person and their property. And out of that text, we, we get the general rule that there should not be a search unless there is a warrant signed by a judge uh, based upon probable cause. And that is that um, a police officer would need to explain to a judge why there is probable cause to believe that a crime has been committed, and then, the, then that detached magistrate, that judge, would issue the warrant, and that's essentially a judicial order uh, to allow police to do a search. Uh, so the general rule is you have to have a warrant, and as with a lot of things, uh, that general rule has kind of been swallowed up by exceptions. So the exceptions, um, actually more important than the rule in this case, uh, there's several recognized exceptions. These are kind of the main ones. There's a lot of different uh, permutations of what these would look like, um, but these are the main ones. Uh, the first one, and this is probably uh, the majority of searches without a warrant would fall into this, is consent. And that is if a police officer asks for your permission to search your person, a place, a car, uh, you, you can tell him yes, and uh, they get to search. So uh, the, the main thing I would take away from this is um, it's okay to tell the police officers no. That's, there's nothing wrong uh, with asserting your right to say, you know what, I, I'd rather not um, have you search my car even though you're asking. Um, the reason I would do that, not necessarily because I drive around with a lot of um, illegal objects in my car, uh, but at the same time, if I give my knucklehead friend a ride home from the bar on Friday night, I don't know what that guy dropped in my car. And so it's just about protecting and understanding uh, what your rights are in any given situation. A plain view is essentially saying that police officers don't have to ignore um, anything illegal when they see it. If they're standing in a place where they have the right to be and they see something that's illegal, they get to seize it. Uh, the, the next one, automobiles, is another huge area. Um, courts have said that you have a lessened expectation of privacy when you drive in your cars, and so uh, because of that, warrant does not, uh, does not apply when you're in your car. An officer needs uh, probable cause to believe a crime has been committed, and if you're in your car, they get to search the entire car. Uh, the most common thing I see in my practice, and I practice criminal defense, is a police officer pulls over a vehicle, smells the odor of marijuana, that's the free ticket to search the car. Pull the person out, um, search the entire car. Uh, next, the search incident to a lawful arrest. And that is essentially if you're arrested, um, anything in your immediate area gets searched along with you. Uh, exigent circumstances, emergency, uh, police officers, if they're responding to a non-criminal uh, call, if there's um, concern about the health of a person, they get to kick in that door, go check on the health of that person, and then the plain view exception would take over. If they go in there and they find something that's illegal, they get to grab it. Uh, hot pursuit, um, if police are actively engaging in a chase and that person runs into a home, usually you would need a warrant to go inside the home, um, but if it is hot pursuit, they're able to go um, inside that home. And essentially, there's no home base when you're running from police. Uh, stop and frisk is for police officer safety. If they're able to articulate a reason why uh, they believe crime may be afoot, it's something much less than probable cause, uh, they get to do a pat-down search for weapons, um, ensure that they're safe. Certain locations are outside of the warrant requirement. Schools and border crossings are two areas that courts have said, well, there's a lessened expectation of privacy, um, and there's other interests involved, and so we're not going to make um, middle school, high school officials go get a warrant, also international border crossings. Uh, courts have said there's, there's just not that same expectation of privacy. Go ahead. Yeah, in, in schools, um, there's students would have a lessened expectation of privacy, and um, administrators will work in conjunction with police. 
Yeah, an, an example would be uh, police, police officers and school officials are allowed to search inside lockers and backpacks really for any reason. They wouldn't need to go get a warrant for that. All right, so we're going to go to the Fifth Amendment. And that's the, the Fifth Amendment's huge, but that's the pertinent part. Uh, no person shall be compelled in any criminal case to be a witness against himself. The strict reading of that would only apply to a trial, a criminal case. After arrest, a prosecutor brings a case, and, and that would just say that a prosecutor can't subpoena the defendant and say, okay, you're under oath, tell us what you did wrong. Um, but, of course, there's a lot, there's a lot more in the the notion has expanded to say, well, there's a lot of different areas where someone might incriminate themselves. Um, it would most often happen in the course of having a conversation with police. In 1966, Miranda v. Arizona came out, and that's when courts said, okay, um, there is definitely a Fifth Amendment right that attaches at some point before trial. And they indicated that when a person is in custody, meaning they're not free to leave, and uh, they're being interrogated, they're being asked questions about a potential crime, the police officers must inform uh, that, that subject uh, that they have a right to remain silent and what you've heard on TV, the right to remain silent, um, you have the right to have an attorney, things of that nature. And so when custody and interrogation are both present, that Miranda right does come into play. Uh, these, are, these are two cartoons I found that actually kind of illustrate I have good legal points. Uh, the first one, I don't know if you could read that, it says Miranda warning. No, this is just a routine traffic stop. You don't get Mirandized until after you finish incriminating yourself. And that's actually true. Uh, the courts have said the Fifth Amendment doesn't apply during traffic stops. Um, even if there is an active investigation, uh, say it's a DUI, there's incriminating questions. How long, how many drinks have you had? Uh, Fifth Amendment just doesn't apply. Uh, the next one, the gentleman sitting across from the officer says, am I under arrest? And the officer says, and require me to advise you of your rights? I think not. So that's, that's something um, that's kind of illustrative of a point on how a lot of officers do an investigation. If you, if you look at a lot of interviews that police officers do, um, police officers don't, they want to get as much information as, can, as they can. Their job is to solve crimes. And so they don't want to advise people of their Miranda rights. So one of the things they would do is say, okay, um, you know, I'd like to talk with you about this, you know, grab a seat, there's the door, you are completely free to leave, I really appreciate your cooperation, but if at any time you want to, to walk out and stop answering my questions, go for it, um, and now that you understand that, let's talk about what you did. And so that's just kind of a, a reality um, that concerns when Miranda rights are usually given. All right, so Fifth Amendment key points. I have be a good citizen, but understand an officer's job. There's a number of different reasons why someone might encounter a police officer. And if you, see, if you are a witness to a crime, if you see something that needs to be reported, by all means do. No one should ever say, well, I'm so concerned about what happens. Um, I know I have these rights, but I don't have to talk to police, so I'm not going to. I think it's important to be a good citizen, but also when you're talking to police, Understand they have a job to do, and that job is to um, investigate crimes and analyze the person um, that they're talking to. Are you someone I should be investigating, or are you someone that's just being helpful? Uh, next, do not make a statement if you feel you are the subject of an investigation or if you actually have something to hide. Um, it is perfectly fine to say, uh, you know, I police officer says, I'd like to, um, to hear your side of the story on this. Um, it is unbelievable to me as a criminal defense practitioner how many people just start talking um, and admit to crimes. You, you do have the right not to talk to police. Um, and if there was a the criminal defense attorney handbook, kind of a hypothetical handbook that told you how to, how to handle any given situation, um, it would always say, um, if you are the subject of an investigation, or if you maybe did something you shouldn't have, you should speak with an attorney before you talk to police. Uh, you may and should decline to make a statement prior to the time an officer must inform you of your Fifth Amendment rights. And that is, um, that's just saying that, of course, Miranda needs to be given at a certain time, but even before then, during that, 
um, that period of time when the police officer is just talking to you and trying to gauge whether or not you're going to have information uh, to give them. Um, if you are the subject of an investigation, it is just always best practice to say, I appreciate you're doing a job, officer. I've always been told by my, my attorney friend that I need to chat with them first, so that's what I'm going to do. Um, something I hear a lot, but hey, I'll look guilty if I do not explain myself. And I tell people to remember the 98-2 rule. I, I just made that up. You can look it on the Internet. There's no 98-2 rule. But what I say is um, if, if someone goes and talks to police and 98% of what they say is helpful to them, it shows that they were in the wrong place at the wrong time, that they didn't do anything wrong. But 2% of their statement actually corroborates other evidence that the police officer has. And that 2% of the statement somehow completes the puzzle that makes the police officer have enough evidence to arrest you, what, what's that police officer going to do? Their job is to investigate and then arrest people. And so even if almost everything you say um, is going to be helpful to you, you just don't know what, what the other evidence is going to look like. And the last thing I would want as your friendly criminal defense attorney is for you to make a statement and say something that seems rather benign but have it be the last piece of the puzzle uh, that gets you arrested. All right, so here is a, an interesting scenario that I had pop up. Um, police have a search warrant for your cell phone. The phone is password protected, and the officer asks for the password. Must you give up your password? So that's actually an open question. I, I couldn't find any direct case law um, on the topic, but I did... Uh, find a few things that I think were helpful in answering that. Uh, number one, um, warrants can compel an accused to provide a handwriting sample or a voice sample. But the courts have said that if, if law enforcement has them do that pursuant to a warrant, that the phrase spoken or the words written must be provided by the law enforcement. And what they're saying is the actual words that you say or the things that you write down, they're expressions of your mind. And that is exactly what the Fifth Amendment is meant to protect. And so um, handwriting samples, voice, these are, these are characteristics that are subject to search warrants, but expressions of your mind are not. In 1988, uh, the U.S. Supreme Court um, analyzed, they were talking about a different issue, but they did talk about um, what would happen if a safe... Um, is the subject of a search warrant. And the search warrant says police officers can go grab that safe. And they said, what if that safe had a key lock and what if it had a combination lock? And the way they analyzed it was, well, a key is something that can be subject to a search warrant. A search warrant can say, go grab that key, open up that safe and see what's in it. A combination is actually an expression of that person's mind. And so, although it wasn't directly um, related to that issue, what the court essentially said was uh, a combination is an expression of their mind, and police officers, you can have the safe. Um, if you can't get into it, that's your problem. So um, warrants uh, can also force a person to get DNA samples and fingerprints. And so if you are a private individual that doesn't want items from your phone um, being discovered even by police with a valid warrant, uh, fingerprint options are actually something that may be the subject of a search warrant, whereas your numbered password may not be. All right, so uh, finish up. Uh, when in doubt, just a question uh, that is very good to ask. If you're interacting with the police officer, am I free to leave? And uh, that, number one, if they say, yes, you are free to leave, you should probably leave. Uh, but number two, if they say you're not free to leave, well, then you're being detained or possibly arrested. And then you have more um, constitutional rights that are going to govern with you. I am going to dismiss, uh, excuse me, to discuss this with my attorney. Never a bad phrase to say. You have the right to say that. And number three, uh, just because it comes up so often, uh, no, you may not search my car. It's something that uh, people should not be afraid to say. Um, they just shouldn't. Uh, and lastly, what I always try to remind people, the overwhelming majority of police officers are very professional, and they are great people. Um, I am very good friends with a lot of police officers. 
Um, I have an important adversarial relationship with them. Uh, but at the same time, almost everyone, I respect what they do. Um, I respect how they do it. And they, they just try to do good. And so what I tell people is um, they're, they're people. If you show them respect, even if you're in a position where you have to tell them no and you have to stand up for your rights, it goes a long way to, to disarming a situation. So please remember that um, when we, um, if you do ever have uh, the kind of encounters we're talking about. And that's my contact information. I'll be around for a few minutes later also. Does anyone have any questions? Yes. That is not correct. Your Fourth and Fifth Amendment rights apply to everyone in the United States, citizen and non-citizen. So um, if you are in the U.S., you, you have these protections. Yeah. Okay, the question was, what about, did you say U.S. citizens that are coming back into the United States and they're having their phones searched? And you've heard it's legal. Um, number one, I am an attorney in Kansas. And so my knowledge of what, what the international law is, um, is is a little more small than someone practicing um, in New York City. At the same time, though, uh, like we talked about, the, the Fourth Amendment exceptions, international border crossings are a place where courts have said you have a lessened expectation of privacy. And they, they rely on national security. They rely on a number of issues, the impracticality of getting a search warrant. But there is a lessened expectation of privacy when you are crossing international borders. So, all right, one more question. Okay, and the question is, there's, there's now this information gathering that can be connected back to you. Um, and how does that affect searches and things of that nature? You know, that, that's going to be an interesting topic because even if, um, even though, I guess, uh, all this information gathering is taking place, um, whether or not that's available to law enforcement and whether or not that's going to be gathered pursuant to a search warrant or a subpoena, um, I think is an open question. And so the kind of the difficult part about my area of law is there's not a lot that we can say, um, okay, in this given situation, here's what you tell the police and they, and they walk away and leave you alone. A lot of it is after you're arrested and after you're charged with a crime because of that information, then we have to start fighting about uh, whether that was lawfully obtained. But um, that wouldn't come up unless police officers do decide to and police departments decide um, to try to take that tact.